Hi, it's Sunday 28th of June, mid-afternoon. I'm Ju Gosling, also known as Ju90, and I'm welcoming you and showing you my home as part of Newham Heritage Month, the theme of which is making a home in Newham. I've lived here in a terrace cottage in Canning Town since November 1985. The house was built about 1905, so it's got quite a history, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that as I show you round. I can't show you the front of the house because we're still in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic, and I'm just gonna show you some of the changes that we've made. So by the front door, there's an air purifier, and then there's my own little quarantine station. Here's some shopping that's just arrived and being put into plastic bags to be quarantined. And over here, tucked up against the cats, is my collection of masks, gloves, wipes, hand sanitizer, plastic bags and so on. All of my outdoor clothes, which of course I'm not going to need for some time to come, have been wrapped in plastic against the virus. And if we come round here, there is more shopping waiting because each delivery goes into a different bag. Also, while we're sitting here, this is one of the pictures that I did in the late 90s when I was an artist in residence in Cornwall with Surface Against Sewage. So I'll show you some more of those pictures from Cornwall as we go round. It's certainly lovely to have lots of photographs of places I've worked keeping us going because you will be the first visitors I've had for 15 weeks. There are two other pieces of my artwork in the hall. This is a portrait of Pauline Radley, which I took on a writer's course at the Arvon Centre in Shropshire. And there is another picture actually of the Arvon Centre sign. And this piece here is one of the digital drawings that I've done with the Together 2012 Art Club. Beyond the bin liners of shopping, this is my little hall. I've generally got a collection of hats and gloves up here, depending on the time of year. This is the cage that the assistance dogs sleep in at night. The things in my house are a real mixture of my artwork, other people's artwork, things that I've upcycled from charity shops, jumble sales, things that have been given to me second hand, things that I've bought in pound shops, including some very kitsch items and also some very kitsch ornaments and things that I've been given as gifts. The main change I've made here since moving in is to put a downstairs toilet into what was the cupboard under the stairs. And that also meant just moving the kitchen door slightly. As my sister said when she first saw it, it's amazing what you can do with a cupboard these days. There's some more photographs from my residency in Cornwall. And here is the first, but by no means the last glimpse of one of my cats. They're all rescue cats. This is Leonardo, who moved in almost two years ago after being found strain with third degree burns to all of his paws. He's much better now, but he has to be an indoor cat like all of the cats here. Jazzy, push, push. You're my first guests in 15 weeks. Usually, if you were here for a meeting or indeed here as a friend, I would be inviting you into the sitting room. This is where I spend a great deal of time and over lockdown, I've tried my best, not entirely succeeding, to get rid of as much work-based papers from here as possible so that we have one space where we're able just to relax, watch the TV, I succumbed and bought a PlayStation so that we've got some entertainment and we've also got Netflix 
so that's been great when we've been relaxing. I have a lot of books dating back from the time that I was a student, although really for about the last three years I tend to read almost everything electronically. But most of these books, I think it's fair to say, won't be available electronically, so I'm very much enjoying keeping my library for the future. The sitting room is one of the smaller rooms in the house, but it's got the most interesting story. And this was how it was told to my then partner back in the late 80s when he was doing the telling for a local election. And a chap came along who I recognised from living down the road. And what he explained was that he used to live in the house, this house. And he said to my partner, have you tried putting a nail in the wall? And he said, yes, but it's very, very difficult. And this chap said, ah, there's a reason for that. This area was very heavily bombed, as of course, all of the south of Newham was very heavily bombed and everywhere you see new blocks, you can assume a bomb fell. The nearest bomb here took out so much of the street that only a little further down the terrace, they're all wooden houses. So apparently as the bomb hit out the back, the back windows were blown out and the dividing wall fell down completely. Most sadly of all, the man of the house died. An ambulance was sent from Lambeth because all of the local mortuaries were full. And as it departed, it was like a Keystone Cops movie for anyone old enough to remember those. The ambulance doors flew open, the body fell out into the street, it had to be put back in again. Despite this, some hours later, the so-called corpse woke up in Lambeth and had to walk all the way back to Newham because public transport had been so disrupted by the Blitz and arrived to find that his death was being mourned and everyone was very surprised to see him. But he lasted for the rest of the war and beyond. I don't really know why they moved. The wall was put back as a cement and concrete wall by a work gang, including among the volunteers, the um, apparently the entertainer Max Bygraves. And his signature, his autograph, I should say, is somewhere under the plaster. When I first moved in, we had a softwood window replacing the old bay window at the back. The house was originally built with two bays at the front and one bay at the back. But because the house is almost directly south facing towards the Thames, the wood gets very rotten very quickly. So by the time I was replacing the window for the third time, I decided to use a small legacy and have a door put in. And that's just been wonderful because now I can sit here and it's also like being in the garden, particularly helpful during the pandemic when for reasons I'll explain in a minute, I can't go out. If I have a decorating theme in this house, it's partly reflecting the fact that I grew up by the seaside and Newham really is London seaside. The Thames is so wide here in Canning Town. And of course we had, I think, over 900 ships built on the banks of the River Lee near Canning Town up until 1911. So we really are in London seaside here and I love the seaside. I don't expect to see it for some time, so it's a great pleasure to me to have seaside themed things here. And the other theme is just objects from all over the world. Newham is very much a home for travellers, probably was thousands of years ago as people sailed up the Thames. Lots of people have settled here as sailors. My great great grandfather was a sailor in Stepney. His son ultimately became a butcher, but he went to the Royal Hospital School at Greenwich to train for the Navy. So maybe it's also in my blood, but it just reminds me that people have travelled here from all over the world. We go backwards and forwards. So it's nice to have objects from all over the world. Again, most of which have been given to me, but I have been lucky enough to go overseas for work on a number of occasions and then I've brought things back as well. And again, it's all memories for me. 
I spend a lot of time here on my own anyway because I'm not able to leave the house without support. My partner who's living here for the duration is usually living off Green Street. So all of these memories gives you that sense of who you are, what your past is and I hope some sense of a future. We're all looking forward to a very bright future in Newham. It's just paused. If you were here for a meeting over the summer, I would usually show you into the garden. My garden's pretty small, but typical for a terrace in Canning Town. It's the width of the house and that's squared. But I love it. It's been a great joy to me over the years. And I'm trying to think back. In the late 90s, I can't be sure, 97 or 98, the King's Cross Girl Guides were kind enough to come in. I'd been in Cornwall at that point for 18 months working and finishing my PhD, and it was just a jungle. And when the guides finished, not a blade was left. They came in so excited because they didn't have their own gardens. They had gardening lectures to do it. They came in with saws and axes, um, although they were very tiny little girls, some of them. And it's been wonderful ever since. I then had a great social care worker who helped me redesign it so that I could manage it almost entirely on my own. And despite the pandemic and not having any help, yeah, I pretty much have been managing it all on my own. I've got some decking tiles waiting to be replaced. The bench needs mending as well, and I've got some replacement panels for that. At the moment, however, we're not using the garden because it's impossible to do a two metre social distancing because the doors and the gardens are just so close together. So I've been turning the garden round, if you like, so that it's safe and we're able to enjoy it from the inside. So where I did have a herb garden, that's moved around. The herbs are now on the kitchen windowsill and between the windows. I have a new fern garden growing where the herb garden was. We're growing tomatoes for the first time. We're growing lettuce for the first time so we can be self-sufficient in salad and seasoning at least. And I'm surprised at just how much joy you can get from a garden without actually sitting out there. So that's just been one of the best bits of lockdown. In the last five years, both of the cottages either side of me have been taken over as houses in multiple occupation. And both landlords have attempted to build in wood over the backyards. One side has been taken down, but for some bizarre reason, this structure is still up. The reason they build them is they rent every single room out as a bedsit, but they're just far too small. So the people who live in the house in order to socialise and also to have somewhere to eat, tend to eat in the gardens. So next door had their structure taken down, they tend to eat in a tent, but this structure is still there and it's obviously quite worrying in terms of a fire risk. This is my kitchen, which is a fairly typical galley kitchen for a terrace cottage of this size. It's pretty much the original with cupboards that I put in in 1992. When we first moved into the house, which was me, my then partner and my brother, there was no real fitted kitchen at all, there was just a sink. Uh, but it hasn't changed much, it has to be said, since the early 90s. This is the front room, which I now use as my office. In a previous life, I think for about five years in the mid-90s, this is where the sponsorship operation was run for the Glastonbury Festival. Glastonbury would have been celebrating 50 years this weekend, but unfortunately, of course, is not taking place because of the pandemic. I mostly use the office for my publishing company, Bethany Press, which I set up in 1994. 
that specialises in books about English culture and particularly English girls fiction of the 20th century. In fact, most of my sales for several years now have been by Kindle. So I still have boxes and boxes of books in storage, but it's not like the 90s and the noughties where I was dispatching and probably in the average year, sending out about 500 books from this office. I also manage my direct payments from the council to employ my social care workers in here. And I have my voluntary sector files in here. I'm a co-chair of REGARD, which is the National LGBTQI plus Disabled People's Organisation. And this weekend is also Pride Weekend. So yesterday we were celebrating Global Pride, having it running on the live stream all day. So I have my REGARD files here. I have my staff management files here. I have my publishing company files here. At the moment, it's also a temporary home for my partner's two cats, which have moved over from Green Street for the duration. So it's been slightly reorganised, sometimes deliberately, sometimes not, and done directly by the cats. And my partner is also using it as a little workspace to do her office work and her crafts. I also use the office for some storage, including my sailing gear. I haven't been sailing for quite a long time. I have to use an adapted boat. I need quite a lot of help and that isn't easy to come by and nor is the transport to get down to the water. But I have in my time sailed in the first Thames boat race and also won many years ago the Susie Lamp Blue Shield at my sailing club down in West Wales. So I've got photos up of that and along with more pictures from my time in Cornwall, it reminds me that I'm not entirely East London bound. The main reason I've been able to stay in this house so long is the help that I've had from the council and from other sources as well. The Job Centre Plus Access to Work scheme put my ramp in. It also paid for things like kneeling chairs and ergonomic seating. The council first of all put in railings, so they put extra rails up the stairs. I have rails by the toilet, I have rails by the bathroom. And critically, with the help of a disabled facilities grant, I was able to put in a walk-in bath and this through, through floor lift. These houses aren't really suitable for large lifts because of the structural engineering work that would needed to be done. So what I do is I keep a wheelchair in the office and a wheelchair upstairs and then I can move between the two. The main difficulty in living in an adapted house and not an accessible house is that I can't have my friends around because most of them need better access than this house has. And that's difficult if you can't go out, but also people can't come to see you. The landing is another room with a seaside theme, but also a vintage theme because it's where I keep my girls' school stories that were the subject of my PhD. I've probably got one of the best collections in the world. It's left to the Women's Library in the event of my succumbing to COVID or anything else. But... I hope to have many years of enjoying these wonderful books to come with fantastic titles and I'm just showing you a few of them now like Leave It to Madge, A Job for the Jays, Meet the New Girl and Self or School. These are wonderful books that are still read in paperback today and contrary to popular opinion are incredibly subversive and very empowering which of course is why they were so popular for so many years.
The bathroom would originally have been the third bedroom with the box room, which no longer exists, being the fourth bedroom. I made the bathroom mosaic about 15 years ago to cover up the wrecked tiles after the builders had put the new bath in. It's based on the concept of things that wash up on the foreshore as the waves are washing sand. But in fact, as you can see here, I should have used a different glue and a lot of the glitter has come off. There are more pictures here from my time in Cornwall. I also have a very sweet doll's house which my partner made for me, based on Derek Jarman's Prospect Cottage. This piece won a student art prize back in the 90s. As a guest, you'd only really get a glimpse into the bedroom unless you were here for some kind of photo shoot, in which case I might indeed use it as a dressing room. But I'm just going to show you around very quickly with a couple of work things and other items. This wall hanging belonged to my friend Nasser Begum, who died very sadly and unnecessarily because of the way her social care was provided, or should I say not provided. So I think of NASA whenever I see this. This is a reproduction poster for the Mods annual London to Brighton run in 1964. My partner and I were part of a comic restaging with scooter users versus wheelchair users in 2014 in Brighton. It was a lot of fun. It was a ducky nightclub. Unfortunately, Brighton have changed the parking and so on and just made it impossible to get to Brighton Pride anymore. This is a back brace that I wear not as much as I used to because I now have high blood pressure, but it's something that helps me to manage my spinal condition and this one up here was made from the same mould and decorated by the artist Andrew Logan. I then wore it in a dance film piece called Fight and both of them were shown in a touring exhibition called A Dawn Equip. It's also been shown in a number of places around the world as well as across the UK in different exhibitions as indeed is the film. These are more recent costumes. These were made for me and indeed gifted to me by Para Carnival, who are the carnival partners for us at Together 2012. The little crown belongs to my assistant's dog, Jazz. And indeed, here is a photograph of me wearing it. So the bedroom is an eclectic mix of kites, hats, clothes, the bedroom suite, which is walnut and came from my grandmother, but um, is rather battered now by years of rescue cats. There's a number of soft toys, not least because if I have my goddaughter to stay, this is where she sleeps and she's only just grown up. This little chap was being sold as part of an art installation, I think at the Arnold Feeney Gallery in Bristol when I was sent down there for a meeting. And as elsewhere in the house, a collage of memories of photographs and postcards, little scraps invites, badges, rosettes and a few random puppets where I can't find anywhere else to put them. So this is my studio where I do my creative work. It's also for the duration the headquarters of Together Unlocked which is Together 2012's live stream. So three times a week on a Monday, Wednesday and Friday, we're recording Together Unlocked live stream from here and then I'm editing it and putting it online. So I anchor, produce and engineer it and co-host it. That's been quite a challenge without warning, but like everything else, I think Newham has coped very well indeed. You're really very fortunate to be invited into the studio. It's very much a one-off. Generally, I keep people in the sitting room as much as I possibly can, unless they're an artist who's come along to work with me. But I think the pandemic has changed many things.
These photos here were some of the first professional shoots I ever did. Again, I think that's in the late 90s. I was asked to model for an organisation called Gaze and then they were kind enough to do photographs as well for my own work. This is a still from the first piece of artwork that I did that could be described as disability arts, which was a piece called My Not-So-Secret Life as a Cyborg. In my not-so-secret life as a cyborg, I wore this decorated back brace and explored doing disability as performance art, as I so grandly described it at the time. The website is still online on my website www.g90.co.uk. I believe in a retrospect that this series of photographs, which I took in 97 with an early digital camera, were the first selfies on the internet. That's not a great record to have. So there's more work here from Cornwall. And I certainly love to be able to see that surfing picture and just to put myself there in my imagination. These three pieces actually should have been on exhibition as part of Newham Heritage Month. They're the drawings of the motion pathways of the animation that I produced called a Kenningtown Trio. This puppet was made by an artist called Amelia Pimlot for a film that I made with my goddaughter when she was about nine or ten. This is my production pass collection. Including, again, going right back to the 90s, some access all area Glastonbury badges, which I must pull out again now it's the 50th anniversary. This is a series of pictures from the making of the Andrew Logan back brace. And this is a small printout at the bottom of what became the original picture, which was shown in the exhibition. I believe it was printed on metal and is now part of Leicester City Council's collection. But, of course, the most beautiful thing in the studio is indeed Leo. This is where the supply of teddy bears comes from for Together Unlocked. Each week we put up a different teddy bear as part of the worldwide virtual teddy bear hunt. As we've come up to the loft, the weather has changed, inevitably because it's June, We've also been joined by Jinx, who's my oldest rescue cat. Jinx was the only surviving kitten of a feral litter and came to me really just because the person who found her was next in the queue at the vet and I'm a bit of a soft touch. So the loft is probably the place we've done the most to change the house. There wasn't a loft conversion when we moved in in 1985. There was the original Victorian slate roof with no roofing felt. In 1988, we replaced the roof. And at that point, it became obvious that it was much easier to do a loft conversion if you were doing the roof at the same time. And effectively, what the builders did was bring in board while the roof was off. We filled the rafters with polystyrene and then the builders boarded it out and they also brought in boards through the roof which were polystyrene backed plasterboard. That's now covered with an acoustic fibre which just helps to make it easier for me to work up here. When we first moved into the house my brother had the box room and then when we converted the loft, he had a ladder up into the loft and this was his bed set. He moved out in 1989 and then we took down the wall of the box room and also put the loft staircase in. So I use the loft for a number of things that are work related. I have a lot of files and different archives under the eaves in terms of storage. I've got a lot of filing cabinets up here. I've also got my hands on art materials, including my weaving loom. And at night, it's also a very nice chill out space. I've got lots of lights and music. I've got my art books up here. I've got my poetry books up here. So this is really the creative hub of the house. This weaving was actually completed when I was 16. It was part of my GCSE artwork. 
This is one of two portraits of me by an artist called Sylvia Janssens. It was a project organised by the late David Morris, who was interested in what happened when you took photographs, sent them to an artist who'd never met the person, created portraits, and then the portraits were going to go on to become other things. Unfortunately, David died before that could happen, but I'm very appreciative to have the portrait. This is a portrait Sylvia did of me for the same project from a photograph of me at Pride. I actually had my Westie Jeannie with me and you can see Jeannie just there. This is another school art piece. I think it was for A-level. These are rubbings from Mount Grace Priory in Yorkshire, from the stones that build a little shelter over the spring. I did a virtual residency at Mount Grace Priory in 1999, and that was my first professional commission after I finished my PhD. There's quite a number of photographs up here that I've taken in Pembrokeshire, somewhere that I find really very inspiring. And this is a series of prints of a piece called Perception 1 to 4, which are really light boxes. And those light boxes are currently on exhibition at Trinity Boy Wharf as part of a rainbow motif. I wanted to be able to make some kind of rainbow to celebrate the NHS and thank them, but I couldn't leave my house. Then I realised that I had a set of light boxes in my storage unit at Trinity Boy Wharf and John Burton, who runs TBW, was kind enough to arrange to get them put out on display. So Perception 1 to 4 is currently on exhibition down at Trinity Boy Wharf, but I just can't go and see it, but I have the prints here. Thank you so much for coming and helping me to celebrate 35 years of making my home in Newham.